All right, hello. Uh, welcome to this lesson. It's Ms. Kat here. Um, I am here to walk you through gathering energy. This is the lesson that's due this Sunday, um, 1 31, January 31st. Um, it is Monday, January 25th. And we're going to walk through the lesson together. And hopefully, if you're having trouble or if you want a little bit of guidance, this video guide will help you work through the lesson. And again, so here we go. This is Gathering Energy, January 31st. Where is the chemical basis of life you did not need to submit your final score? You do need to go back to doing that for this lesson. So make sure that you're submitting um, your final score and one sentence summary of what you learned. That's just to um, gather your knowledge and put it in one concise little sentence there to get credit. All right, so you ready to begin? Here we go. Gathering Energy. Let's start the lesson. So we're going to read through this together. Um, we all know that we need to eat to get energy, but how does the food we eat power our bodies? When you get down to the molecular level, our bodies would appear as a swirling mess of molecules with millions of chemical reactions every second. Our bodies and other living things have an advanced and elegant way of taking energy from food, storing it, and then using it later. In this lesson, you will review the nutrients found in food as well as how various organisms get their food. You will go through an overview of cellular respiration, the process of releasing energy from food. Last, you will look at a chemical bonds and how a remarkable molecule called ATP stores energy. So in our last lesson, you looked at energy molecules and I might have said ATP a couple times, but in this lesson, we'll actually dive into what that energy molecule that you use to make your RNA and you use to make your protein to fire your nerve cell what that actually looks like and why that releases energy. Um, and then we'll look at this process of cellular respiration. So if you think of the word respiration, you might think to breathe. And that's basically what your cells are doing, but at the cellular level, it's actually breaking down food using oxygen in order to make this molecule, ATP. Okay, so I don't know, breathe in. Get ready, you ready to go. This learning objective is to recognize various forms of energy in the physical world. And then we're going to explain and delineate the process of fermentation and anaerobic respiration, accounting for the molecules involved, including those consumed and produced. All right, this is kind of a big lesson, so let's see what we get out of it. We are all kinds of food. We eat all kinds of foods. Yeah, what's your favorite food? Um, mine is egg burritos. That's like my favorite thing to make right now. Each kind has different chemicals our bodies need called nutrients. The nutrient content of the foods below is given per serving. Answer both questions before clicking the next button. All right, look at the foods pictured at the bottom of the page. What are the main nutrients found in these foods? All right, so we have steak. It has fat and protein. Here we go, select, flat, fat, and protein. Apples have lots of carbohydrates. They have lots of, lots of fructose in fruit. Um, eggs have carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then broccoli has carbohydrates and proteins. Um, so broccoli also has fiber. So I don't know if we'll select fiber and see if that's right. Then our second question here is to select the two foods below with the greatest amount of carbohydrates. So if we look through, scan, which one has more carbohydrates? Eggs or broccoli? Broccoli, next. Okay, so now we're learning fiber is important for our bodies, but our bodies don't break it down into chemicals we can use. Instead, it passes through us. It's not a nutrient. All right, there we go. Now we know. How did we get this wrong? Oh my gosh, apples. I totally overlooked apples as a high source of carbohydrates. All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, we really need to, this is, I'm just giving you, I'm demonstrating how important it is to read through this lesson. It here select, says select two foods. So we were not wrong in selecting the broccoli, but we also needed to select the apple. There we go. All right, here we go, now we're on a roll. 
Carbohydrates. It's the main largest group of nutrients in our food. They are grouped into classes depending on the size of the molecule. You will probably recognize the names of many of these carbohydrates already. So yeah, how many of you guys have heard of glucose or sugar, sucrose, and starch? What is the smallest unit of carbohydrate? Use the images to the right to answer. Okay, so it looks like this is the smallest unit, so I would say glucose. Okay, function. Um, the smallest form of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide called glucose. It is shown as a hexagon, a six-sided polygon. This represents a major part of the actual chemical structure between five carbons and one oxygen atom. Um, so yeah, this is that's how you get the hexagon here, is you have five carbons together and then one little oxygen. Um, what do you think our bodies do first with the larger carbohydrates we consume in food? So if we were to eat a starch, what do you think happens? Um, first, they break them down into glucose. All right, our, what are our energy needs? Carbohydrates are important nutrients that supply energy for pretty much everything that happens in our cells. Our bodies break down larger carbohydrates into the sugar, glucose. The glucose is used to power our muscles, nervous systems, and more. So we saw that when we needed our nerve cell to fire, we needed glucose. Um, to the right is a graph of what it glucose as our bodies breaks down for energy. Um, so we can ask here, why are the lines looking jagged? They have jagged lines due to uncertainty or randomness in the data. In instruments, this randomness is called noise, and it's similar to the sound you might hear in a radio station that isn't broadcasting. Slight random variations in the data. That's a good explanation. All right, so generally as we read this graph from left to right on our x-axis, we see time increases. What happens to the concentration of, let's just look at the first line that's the most obvious, oxygen goes down, glucose also goes down, and at the same time water goes up and carbon dioxide goes up. So now we can answer that here. Carbon dioxide is increasing, nitrous oxide is not present, glucose is decreasing, nitrogen gas not present, water vapor increasing, oxygen decreasing. All right, next. Based on the graph, what do you think is happening to the glucose with respect to other molecules? Is it nothing happening to it? It stayed the same. Well, no, we can see it's decreasing. Did it turn into oxygen? That might, in, you might say then the oxygen would have increased if that was true. So it decreased while oxygen increased. And again, we see that's not true. It decreased while carbon dioxide increased. Our graph does show that. Okay, so we're part, starting to piece together this super important chemical reaction, which is cellular respiration. So in each one of our cells, we need energy. It's called cellular respiration, and your body is doing it right now. In the human body, glucose gets broken down completely in your cells with the help of oxygen to release energy. Carbon dioxide and water are waste products in this process, which is why you breathe out carbon dioxide. Here's an equation. Glucose plus oxygen. This little arrow means it yields or goes to carbon dioxide and water and energy. Where do you think the process described here happens? Um, arms, legs, ears, cells. It happens in every single one of your cells. Um, okay, so then because it happens everywhere, we can select all of them. Cool. Um, remember the outputs of cellular respiration. What do our bodies produce that is left behind in the environment? Um, so what is left behind carbon dioxide and water? Do, okay, how common is cellular respiration? We've established that all living things need energy. We humans use cellular respiration to obtain energy from our food. But what about other forms of life? Do you think they also perform cellular respiration? So do you think animals do? Fungi, plants, and bacteria? That's right, they all do. 
It happens differently in different living things. For instance, we humans need oxygen to help us break down sugar from foods and cellular respiration. But some organisms don't use oxygen for cellular respiration. Some don't even take in sugar. But that's another story we'll get to shortly. So yeah, you might guess that plants here make their own sugars. What's for dinner? It's about dinner time here. It's about four o'clock. Um, so getting pretty hungry, let's learn a little bit more about what we eat. Organisms must take in nutrients and other compounds to perform cellular respiration. Many animals do this by eating food and breathing in oxygen. But animals aren't the only living things that exist. For, there are other living things, including plants, bacteria, fungi, and archaea. If you've come to the live lessons, we've talked about archaea a little bit. Those are our extremophiles, the things we find in places like Yellowstone. And if you remember back to the animal classification unit, all the way down in the um, South Pole in Antarctica. What do you think plants take in for their energy needs? What do plants use? Sunlight, um, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, it's not quite right. Okay, maybe not water. They do use water. I don't know why that wasn't right. Let's look, take a look back. Okay, what do you think plants take in for their energy needs? Um, water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide. Okay, I'm not quite sure why that's not right. But I did not write this program. We're just walking through it, so let's learn together. Um, trophisms, autotrophy. Remember, imagine that you could produce your own food just from light and or chemicals around you. Wouldn't that be cool? Some organisms can do just that. They're called autotrophs or producers. We learned that in our last unit. Auto meaning self and troph meaning feed. They produce their own food from substances in their environment um, in addition to light or chemicals. Why are autotrophs called producers? They produce their own food. Great. So there are different kinds of autotrophs. Plants are examples of photoautotrophs using light, photo meaning light. Um, and they produce food and they use that material to build their tissues. The process is called photosynthesis. Um, here is an equation. Carbon dioxide plus water plus energy goes to glucose and oxygen. Um, what does the plant need to take in to make its own food? The inputs are on the left side of the equation. So carbon dioxide, water, and energy. What detectable traces does the plant leave in the environment through its own process of making food? So it leaves what is left over here, oxygen and glucose, but here's oxygen. Where do you think most of the plant biomass comes from? It's an interesting question. Um, some people used to think it came from the soil until they did this experiment where they figured out that as a plant grows, the soil mass doesn't change. Instead, that mass comes from carbon dioxide in the air. All right. Photoautotrophs in detail. Let's take a closer look. We've seen that photoautotrophs, such as plants, use photosynthesis to make their own food. From what you've learned so far about living things, do you think plants gather energy in any other way? Which of the following is the most accurate description of plants? They all use photosynthesis, but not cellular respiration. Well, we just learned that all things do cellular respiration, so that's not right. They make their own food or sugars um, that they then use for a variety of things, including cellular respiration. Um, that's pretty true. That This next one is not true, and that is also not true. So, cool. They do both. Heterotrophy. This little chipmunk here shows us. Heterotrophs consume other animals for food, other things for food. That's plants or animals. Um, there are different types. Chemoheterotrophs, chemo meaning chemical. They consume organic molecules from plants and or animals as our energy source. Think about chemoheterotrophs, you know, cats, dogs, humans, cows. What kind of organisms do they eat? Um, 
It depends. If you're eating just animals, um, you might call yourself a carnivore. If you're eating just plants, you might call yourself a vegetarian or a heterotroph or a primary consumer. Um, all of those work. All right. So photoautotrophs and chemoheterotrophs, those are big words, but we can dissect them now because we know photoautotrophs use the sun. They do photosynthesis. That's plant photoautotrophs. Um, and then here, who does cellular respiration? We know that both plant photoautotrophs and heterotrophs do cellular respiration. Trophism sort. All right, let's figure out who is a photoautotroph. That's things that use the sun to make their own food. Volvox is a pretty cool organism here. It's the largest, uh, it's the largest unicellular photoautotroph, which is pretty neat. Um, humans are chemoautotrophs, sloths use oxygen, and organic molecules, and mold. What do we think about mold? Remember what we talked about in our live lesson on Friday. Mold is a fungus, and it's actually closer to animals than it is to bacteria. So it is a chemoheterotroph. It uses organic, breaks down organic molecules like your bread if you leave it out too long. All right, pause and reflect. You just spent some time learning about these major topics. How well do you think you understand them? So we did practice graphing, that's cool. We practiced trophy, auto versus hetero versus chemo versus photo. Cool, and here we have some additional review questions from our last unit. Energy and chemical bonds. We need glucose to fuel our bodies and we get it from eating carbohydrates and food. Other organisms such as plants make glucose from carbon dioxide and water as well as sunlight. But how does glucose give us energy? This, where is energy coming from? Um, the useful energy in glucose is stored in its covalent bond. Remember what a covalent bond is? It is when two atoms share electrons. So let's figure out what are chemical bonds. Um, you could say I don't remember, or you could try to guess here. Electrons are shared between atoms. Molecules that are attracted to each other by orthostatic tension. Wow, they never use that word, so that seems a little unfair to throw that out there for you, but um, chemical bonds could be a sugar phosphate backbone is an example. Neutrinos, we did not talk about neutrinos either, so, okay, weird question. All right, electron acceptors. A covalent bond stores the useful energy in glucose. When these bonds are broken, high energy electrons are transferred from glucose to oxygen. This energy is then stored in a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. And if you want to break any of this down, you might look for the word tri. So how many phosphates do you think there are? There are three. The process takes many steps and is run by enzymes. Remember, we've looked at enzymes. They're proteins that help things happen in the cell such as in the nucleus to help DNA go to RNA, or at a ribosome to take the RNA and make a protein. So there's other enzymes that help break down food in the mitochondria to make energy. So the electrons don't go directly from glucose to oxygen. The electrons are carried by special molecules called electron acceptors that later give them up to oxygen. These electron acceptors are called um, nicotinamide, nicotinamide aden adenine dinucleotide. Uh, bonus points if you can say that three times fast. We can just abbreviate it as NAD+, and flavin adenine adenine dinucleotide FAD. Okay, so all of that to say, here we go. We have these electrons, and we need to put them in which are the electron acceptors. That one will accept an electron. This one will accept an electron, but not those two. Okay. So they're accepting the electrons in what we call the electron transport chain. Where do they get the electrons from? 
Once electron acceptors NAD plus and FAD have the electrons, they become NADH and FADH2. Similar to a bus that lets on and off passengers, the NAD plus and FAD are like an empty bus, while NADH and FADH2 are like full buses. The passengers are high energy electrons with a final destination of oxygen. Um, okay. I'm going to just keep reading through this and I'll describe it afterwards in maybe simpler terms. NADH and FADH2 are called electron donors since they donate electrons to oxygen. This takes place during the final step of cellular respiration. Once the NADH and FADH2 give up electrons to oxygen, the final electron acceptor in aerobic, which means with oxygen, cellular respiration, they return to their empty bus state. NAD plus and FAD can now return to earlier steps in cellular respiration to accept more electrons. Here it says electron donors give up electrons, but where do they go? Show where you think they go in the activity below. All right, so the electrons, they just said, go to oxygen. Um, and so this is a controlled way that the cell breaks down the electrons that are released from the bonds of breaking glucose and it puts them into oxygen. As it does that, it's able to generate a high energy molecule called ATP. All right, so we're going from glucose to our buses, NADH and FAD into oxygen. All right, so here's the money-making molecule, energy storage molecule called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. It's a molecule used for all living things for energy, it is the product of energy gathering processes like cellular respiration and photosynthesis. It's like a rechargeable battery for cells. It releases energy when the covalent bond between the second and third phosphate group is removed, leaving adenosine diphosphate or ADP. How many phosphates then are present? Two. One has been removed. And that's where you get this extra phosphate. ADP is produced or recharged back to ATP through cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Okay, so it looks like this, our chemical reaction. ATP, and this arrow, remember that means yields or goes to ADP plus P plus energy. Which of the following charged forms of the energy, which of the following is the charged form of the energy storage molecule? So the charged up form is ATP. All right, so now we're in this little simulation where we can understand this better visually. So here we go. We have phos three phosphates. Oh, let's read the directions first. Explore the structures of ATP and ADP as represented by visual schematics. We learned this word. It's a representation that uses graphic symbols rather than realistic pictures. It usually omits or leaves out all details and may add unrealistic elements that aid in comprehension. So here, this is a super simplified way of understanding ATP to ADP. We're going to drag these from here over onto the gray triangles to complete this equation. All right, so let's add three phosphates into the gray boxes. Let's add in um, this next gray box is just a phosphate. There it is energy represented by that molecule of a lightning bolt and then we're left with two phosphates here and one of those was removed as the one is removed remember that energy is released and that is what helps drive chemical reactions within the cell okay so we just spent some time learning about these major topics how well do you think you understand them chemical bonds electron acceptors ATP structure and function. Um, and I would take a minute there. I didn't really take so much of a minute. But if you want, if you're taking notes along with us, um, you might want to pause and look over your notes. Chemical bonds are a sharing of electrons. Electron acceptors, what are those two molecules? The buses that transport the electrons from glucose to oxygen. In the meantime, making the structure of ATP, which is the energy-carrying molecule. It's like the money of the cell. Okay, I guess. Yeah, do that again. All right. 
All right, and that's the summary of the lesson. We learned the basic energy needs of organisms, nutrients and foods, basics of cellular respiration, concepts relating to how organisms get their food, chemical bonds, and energy in the form of ATP. Um, this was all, this is in terms of chemical energy. So you might think of other types of energy like um, mechanical energy. That's like if you were to spin a wheel, uh, that would generate mechanical energy. You have potential energy locked up in the bonds and it creates kinetic energy, the movement um, of the electrons down the electron transport chain which ultimately turns a little wheel that makes ATP. That's how that molecule gets made, which is kind of cool. Um, so we looked at aerobic respiration. That's when you need oxygen. And we looked at what's consumed and what's produced. And we looked at photosynthesis and what is consumed and produced. So these are opposite reactions, but aerobic respiration is done in every single type of plant, animal, and well, sorry, respiration is done in every life form. Um, some of them do anaerobic respiration. For example, things like fermentation, which is kind of a whole separate topic I think we'll probably talk about in our live lesson. Seems like a fun place to go from there. Um, and that's things like there's lots of different foods that use anaerobic respiration to make tasty foods like um, sauerkraut, things like that, and kombucha. It's a nice, tasty drink. All right, I hope you learned a lot um, and are able to have walked through this lesson. Make sure you go back to Canvas, report your score, um, and a one-sentence summary of what you learned from this lesson. Thanks so much. Hope to see you on the live lesson on Friday. Bye-bye.